Mao deeply resented India's role in Asia and saw India simply as a continuation of the British Empire. Hello and welcome to Strat News Global. I'm Nitin Gokhale. You're on our weekly program, The Gist. And with me today are two distinguished guests. To my extreme left, Professor Sumit Ganguly, uh, currently professor at the Bloomington University, but shortly or maybe in six months moving to uh, Hoover Institution at Stanford uh, from 1st of September. Also a strategic uh, thinker, writer, uh, and someone who watches uh, both India-US, in US-China, India-China rivalries and competition across the globe. Uh, visiting India right now, therefore this occasion for us to meet him and quiz him on his new book, uh, which is co-authored with uh, two other authors on what is called the Sino-Indian Sino -Indian rivalry and very interesting conclusions and findings which we'll talk about. But to my immediate left, uh, familiar face on Strat News Global occasionally uh, coming and talking to us uh, again. A wise uh, man who's got vast experience, Major General Dipankar Banerjee, who served in Ladakh and all other conflict areas in the uh, Northeast, as well as uh, then, later in his second innings, has been one of the leading thinkers in uh, strategic circles in India and abroad. So welcome both of you for this program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Sumit, let me start with your book, uh, which, uh, of course, this is a South, Adi South Asia edition, as yes. I can see. Yes. And uh, interesting, uh, the, the title is uh, fine, Sino-India Rivalry, but the small line here, implications for global order, is what interests me. And your conclusions I was reading, and let me start with that, that you've spoken about uh, the uh, larger context where U.S.-China rivalry uh, may not be free of uh, India input. Uh, so, uh, tell us about that and why this book and why now? Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to begin with. I'm most grateful to you and to General Banerjee. Um, most people tend to focus on the U.S.-China rivalry and they don't see that the Sino-Indian rivalry has any relationship whatsoever with the U.S.-China rivalry. But in this book, we argue that the two rivalries, whether one likes it or not, have become interconnected. And in large measure, it has to do with the American pivot to Asia, harking back to President Obama, continued then by Trump, and then, even though the same language is not used, Biden has basically followed the same strategy. And because of the Sino-Indian rivalry and the growth of U.S.-India relations and the improvements in U.S.-India relations and the strategic partnership, now the, the two rivalries have become interconnected. Uh, uh, whether one likes it or dislikes it is a separate matter, but they have become integrally linked. And the Chinese are especially concerned about India's growing closeness to the U.S. And at the same time, it's their behavior that's leading India to fitfully embrace the U.S., despite reservations, despite concerns about strategic autonomy and the like. Why did we write this book now? Because uh, uh, my student, Manjit Pardesi, and I had previously worked on the Sino-Indian rivalry, on Sino-Indian relations, and my co former colleague, William Thompson, is one of the global authorities on rivalries. And so, we thought we could merge our collective expertise and thereby produce a book on an extremely topical subject. 
which uh, is very interesting that you have connected so many uh, rivalries or they you know taken the historical context in fact there were some ta there are some tables here which uh, hark back to or date back to 1494 if i am not mistaken some of the rivalries and which led to wars and what happened in europe and other continents yes but uh, coming back to india china rivalry you have also spoken about two distinct threads in the rivalry one is the special uh, rivalry between india and china which is about the border and the boundary dispute and uh, the positional rivalry so if you can explain to our viewers what does that mean really absolutely um the a positional rivalry simply involves two states in a particular region of the world in this case asia where both states are jockeying for a certain standing or status within that region and this positional rivalry unlike what a number of american scholars have written who've been dismissive of india and saying oh the chinese don't really consider india to be a rival this is nonsensical we demonstrate that the rivalry actually even precedes the communist revolution the kmt saw india the kuomintang saw india as a potential rival in asia and mao simply built upon it and um, mao deeply resented india's role in asia and saw india simply as a continuation of the british empire so the rivalry actually even precedes the communist revolution of 1949 and that's when it started as a positional rivalry subsequently because of differences over inherited colonial borders it becomes a territorial spatial rivalry where it's a matter of tibet's role in sino-indian relations um Uh, the delineation of the border both in the northeast and in uh, uh, ladakh over which uh, the the chinese have very different interpretations and as one knows well um, that they start to surreptitiously uh, make incursions into areas that india considered to be its own based upon british cartography that's true so that's very well explained i think and uh, people will like to know more about it but general vanity let me turn to you you have watched uh, sino india relations and also of course been deployed in the high altitudes of ladakh i think 28th division uh, was something that you've uh, worked upon in uh, those years over the years uh, why has china uh, not realize that india's uh, growing strength and growing attention to uh, china as a principal rival uh, means that it cannot decisively uh, sort of win against india even if it can create these incursions and troubles and yet they continue to have these uh, pin pricks and you know the border incidents and now of course uh, large body of uh, mass of uh, troops are amassed in ladakh and elsewhere why do you think china is doing that are they misreading india are they uh, overconfident what is it thank you nitin for having me on the program and for raising this very important question i think this is the perspective which this book addresses very well and it is one of the important perspectives that we need to pay attention to now because all the current developments and the war in ukraine and the developments in the gaza israeli situation is making a situation emerge globally which is challenging the global order very fundamentally and that of course in that overall context sino indian rivalry will be an important aspect important element in global developments that understanding has yet to mature that is why this book is important to identify and put in context this major relationship as we look into the next decade or just beyond that three powers will impact on the global order that is the us not quite in decline china not quite on the rise current economic problems reflect on that and india is surely on the rise 
if currently representing perhaps the global south, but nevertheless as a significant major force in global affairs. And in that context, this three relationship become very important to identify. And therefore, this particular issue of the Sino-Indian rivalry assumes importance. Sure. You're right. China has, under the communist regime, not quite accepted India at par with itself. And therefore, in all my interactions going back now 33 years, at the highest level between India and China, I was the first uh, one of two generals from the Indian Army, which was invited by the PLA to visit the PLA in 1991. And since then, one has perceived that perspective, per perception in China. That needs to change. And the reason it needs to change are identified significantly. The history and the re reasons it needs to change is reflected very, very well in this book. That, that's very well put, I think, because uh, this book, of course, needs uh, very concentration. Uh, I mean, a lot of concentration to read it because you've got historical facts here and context and the framework that you've worked in. So uh, I recommend this to uh, scholars of uh, international relations, but particularly Sino-India and Sino-US uh, relations. But coming back to uh, what we were talking about of how, uh, and you spoke about it, in fact, that was one of my questions, that India is in a no-win situation in a way, if you look at uh, this triangle. On the one hand, the Chinese say, uh, we are uh, concerned that India is going into the US camp or is becoming much closer to the US. Uh, whereas India, uh, or India is accused or at least uh, there are reservations amongst the Quad countries, which is US, Australia, Japan. India is not doing enough in the Quad grouping and therefore it is a weak link in the Quad and uh, China would like to play on that. So both sides actually have suspicions about India. How does India overcome this dilemma really? This is a real conundrum that India is faced with because either way it turns, it's going to make someone unhappy. I think you've really grasped the nub of the problem here. On the one hand, India is proceeding with great caution and publicly stating we don't want the Quad to be seen as a militarized organization. Or an Asian NATO. Or as an Asian NATO. Um, and Indian diplomatic statements on this subject have been very deft and nuanced. Why? For fear that any ca a careless statement could easily provoke Beijing's wrath. And consequently, India has assumed a very hedged position, which, as you correctly pointed out, has irritated the members of the Quad. Why aren't you stepping up? You know, you are an integral member of this organization. It's time you, you know, put your, um, uh, 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 your strength behind it and uh, assume certain responsibilities. On the other hand, the Chinese keep making intemperate statements saying, you know, if you think you're going to get close to this organization called the Quad and uh, deepen your strategic partnership with the United States, there will be consequences. And so there's this fundamental tension that Indian diplomacy is trying to negotiate. Uh, through. And there is no simple answer. But on the other hand, China cannot exercise a veto on India's foreign and security policy choices. This is a matter that has to be made clear to the Chinese, and this will require a certain amount of courage and resoluteness on the part of India's decision makers. There is every possibility, in fact, at one point I said that uh, Galwan is like a streetcar. Um, this was a term that McGeorge Bundy, the national security advisor um, uh, under uh, uh, President Kennedy, and had said uh, after an attack at an American base called Plaiku right. in Vietnam. Yes. He said, Plaikus are like streetcars. And I said, Galwan is a streetcar. There's another one coming. Right. But that is precisely why India needs to be prepared to build up its own capabilities and quietly 
pursue the strategic relationship with the United States. That's right. So on that note, in fact, I wanted to ask General Banerjee, the building India's military economic capability should be the priority. And it is now being given enough attention. Um, thankfully, the entire attention of the uh, establishment, if I can use that term, has turned towards China uh, and not obsessed with Pakistan as we used to be in India earlier. How does India or Indian military cope with this changed circumstance and what should they be doing as, as a former military man? That's a very important question. And that's a question that needs to be addressed by the decision makers of India in a very careful and deliberate manner. It is indeed true. Pakistan has outlived its utility as a challenge to India. It's a failed state. Let's accept it. It, it. it is a challenge to India in several dimensions primarily limited to short terrorist uh, activities. And that cannot be ignored. But I think Indian foreign policy today confronts China as a real global challenge to India's emergence as a global power. And that context, we need to be careful and address fully and comprehensively the Chinese challenge, no longer I wouldn't call it a threat, in all its various dimensions within which I think a very important element is, of course, the economic, industrial and technological capabilities of India, which is for the first time being addressed in a very significant way in India now. But in addition to that, the military strategic confrontation will also be very important. I have fortunately or unfortunately been involved in the northern borders for the last 50 years and more, actually. There's a remarkable change in the infrastructural capabilities and our readiness in the northern sector. In the Tawang sector, for example, many years ago, you know, we addressing the sailor pass, one always confronted that enormous obstacle, obstacle not only for Chinese incursion into India, but our movement forward. Just yesterday, that entire sailor complex, you know, the, the underground tunnel leading on to Tawang, it's a revolutionary change, which I could not have imagined at that time. Similar changes have taken place in Ladakh, Eastern Ladakh in particular. And so the Indian Armed Forces, the theaterization of forces now taking place, uh, Indian strategy, etc., is now fully capable of confronting China's military threat in whatever dimension it emerges. We are no longer blocked by the nuclear asymmetric capabilities. We match that as well. And so therefore, it is time that China looked at this in a different perspective. That change has not come about in China as yet. But I suspect, even as its position declines and India improves steadily, that will come about. But the point I would like to make here is that this a challenge that will remain for some years. And we require to be pre prepared in all the multifarious dimensions of the challenge in a comprehensive manner. Perhaps apply um, Deng Xiaoping's uh, you know, uh, adage about uh, biding your time and building your strength and keeping your heads down applies to India right now. And that's why I think this strategy of hedging that uh, Sumit spoke about. But, you know, uh, the other uh, issue that I was very interested in in your book was you've spoken about five uh, flashpoints uh, between US and China uh, or four flashpoints that could emerge. Uh, of course, the Koreas, uh, the Taiwan Straits, uh, you've got uh, the Indian Ocean, India, China and one more, I, I forget. But uh, amongst that, uh, which one you think uh, has the... Uh, the most dangerous potential to become a, a flash, I mean, turning into a confrontation or a conflict between US and China? The most uh, compelling one, I think, <coughs> are the Taiwan Straits, because uh, the leadership uh, in Beijing is absolutely unyielding on that point and has been trying to isolate Taiwan. It has bribed, it has cajoled, it has threatened any number of countries that had recognized Taiwan as an independent state. And now, if memory serves, it has shrunk to about 12. And 
Furthermore, the exercises that they've been periodically holding, um, uh, the occasional um, uh, uh, resort to artillery fire and the like, and the sheer proximity and the capabilities that they possess. I've been to both Komoi and Matsu, and uh, you recognize the vulnerability. And in fact, a senior Taiwanese general said, we are the canary in the coal mine. Uh, we have no illusions about being able to defend these islands, but if they attack us here, then we'll know this is the prelude to, to a the much, larger invasion. much larger invasion. And I said, so you are sacrificial lambs. Mm -hmm. He said, Professor, I signed up for this. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so that the, yeah. the most important question here then is, is, does the U.S. have the stomach and the capability to deter China uh, from doing this? Or if China does uh, initiate an invasion, does it then uh, really confront China here? That's the question. This is <laughs> really the critical question. Um, obviously, American statements suggest that the U.S. will, uh, will not allow a, um, a military uh, takeover uh, of Taiwan. And there are any number of compelling reasons, quite apart from the fact that Taiwan is one of the uh, major forges of semiconductors, uh, which is critical to any number of industries in the United States. Um, despite Biden's efforts to reshore, it's going to take a decade well, uh, before the U.S. has those capabilities uh, and the like. Second, a failure to defend Taiwan would have terrible consequences for other alliance relationships. That if you are so unreliable, how can we in Japan or South Korea count on you when the chips are down? And you can even visualize the South Koreans saying, we might have to overcome our hesitation about pursuing nuclear weapons. Sure. Uh, so, uh, there are compelling American reasons, um, despite sort of a, an element of strategic ambiguity, to ensure that deterrence holds in the Taiwan Straits. That's right. So, you wanted to add something, yes. In that context, Sumit, may I also ask you, yeah. what might happen in a Trump presidency? Ah, this is something that one worries about a great deal because uh, despite um, his uh, uh, self-inflated talk about being a very stable genius, to use his own language, I don't think Trump um, uh, especially cares about Taiwan and also seems impervious to advice. Furthermore, Trump has a reflects a profound isolationist streak that has long existed in American foreign policy, harking to the early part of the 20th century. And he has tapped into that sentiment. The question is, in the event of an impending crisis, would he listen to the professional military? I simply don't know. Uh, Nobody seems to know. <laughs> no one seems to know. And consequently, this must be a source of acute concern in Taipei. Absolutely. That's true. So that concern and my final probably uh, question asking you, in case of a uh, rising uh, confrontation between India and China, if the balloon goes up, how will U.S. react and how should India expect, what should India expect from the United States? <laughs> Once again, much depends on who's in office. Uh, this is not exactly a state secret because a number of reliable sources uh, uh, addressed this issue that there was the provision of real-time intelligence, uh, including satellite imagery, during the Galwan crisis that was shared with India from, from the United States. Will the U.S. Um, put boots on the ground? No, that's just... And would India want it also is the question? Right, the and also ground. I'm not sure yeah. that India would want that. Yeah, exactly. But 
we need to bear in mind, uh, and this is discussed in the book, that in 1962, the U.S. actually flew aircraft oh, from yes. Orissa mm -hmm. with Indian Air Force markings. Sure, but yeah. Yeah. Yes. And then uh, and, uh, between 1962 and about 1971, um, uh, the U.S. Uh, collaborated with India in terms of reconnaissance flights, in terms of uh, information sharing, in terms of intelligence sharing. Henry Kissinger, because of the opening to China, put an end yes. to all of this and also basically allowed the Kampas to be massacred completely by, by Beijing. Yeah, because it was utter that, callousness. Because that program was run from uh, in collaboration with India, the, yes. uh, the Tibetan resistance. Precisely. So I have that uh, full chapter on that on my biography of R.N. Kao, who was the founder of ARC and then of course subsequently SFF he added and then of course founded the RNAW. Right. But that's a different uh, discussion. One final question to you, General Banerjee, and then we'll end this conversation. The uh, other aspect of the Sino-India relationship or uh, tension is also the growing uh, dependence of the larger, bigger powers like the United States, uh, so-called Indo-Pacific construct. A lot of people are saying that the Indo part of the Indo-Pacific should be outsourced to India. India's naval power is uh, beginning to rise and beginning to become stronger than it was before. How does China see that and does it then play into uh, or feed into the, uh, the kind of tension that India, in, uh, India and China are facing right now? That's a very important question for the immediate future. You know, this is an issue and a strategic challenge that we need to be very carefully concerned about right now, especially in collaboration with our partners, wherever they are, in the Quad or elsewhere. And that is a policy and a relationship that we need to evolve steadily and gradually. As it stands, there has to be much greater all-round cooperation regarding these forces. Much of the initiative regarding the Quad actually, starting with the Milan exercises, started from 1992. And Malabar. The Malabar exercises. Yes. I was present at that conference in the US when our former, uh, later Chief of Defense, Chairman Chief General Staff, uh, Sushil Kumar, Admiral Sushil Kumar, announced that first time in the U in US. In that context, we have to be prepared and develop a whole range of uh, collaborations. Strategic military cooperation, diplomatic uh, policy orientations, ideas regarding an order in Asia that allows uh, not the dominance of China and its Chinese worldview being imposed on Asia, but a worldview that is based on a common future, sharing of the global prosperity that will emerge to a significant extent from Asia itself, and therefore a relationship that depends upon that, and in which India, both diplomatically and strategically, will have a major role to play. That's true. So that's a good note to end this discussion on. Uh, thank you very much, both of you, for uh, giving these insights. It's a fascinating subject. We can go on and on for hours together, but uh, limitation of time on such programs uh, prevents me from asking you further questions or discussing with you various uh, threads to this entire strategic conundrum, if you uh, want to call it that. So thank you very much once again. Uh, do keep watching Strat News Global. You know where to reach us. Your comments and feedback are always welcome. And our social media handles, our YouTube channel is uh, visible on the screen. Do subscribe if you haven't already. And if you have, do spread the word amongst your friends and acquaintances so that uh, you get a different perspective on foreign policy, strategic issues and defense uh, from Strat News Global. For the time being, it's goodbye.